Colleagues, thank you for being here after school and uh, to talk about seeking God in all things, to talk about how our classes and the content in our discipline have something to do with the faith that we're trying to form young men in. I'm grateful that you guys took the extra time uh, to be with us. And thanks to the, uh, to the folks out in the America listening uh, and viewing audience for being with us as well. Um, let's begin, we'll do introductions in a moment, with prayer. Uh, this is a prayer, a commentary by Howard Thurman, uh, the American spiritual writer, and, and a prayer to follow. The movement of the Spirit of God in the hearts of men and women often calls them to act against the spirit of their times or causes them to anticipate a spirit which is yet in the making. In a moment of dedication, they are given wisdom and courage to dare a deed that challenges and to kindle a hope that inspires. God, we ask for that wisdom and that courage to continue in the work of education and formation, work that depends upon our recognizing your presence in all things, including the disciplines and the modes of teaching and learning that all of us pursue. And we dedicate all of our thoughts, words, and actions to the greater glory of God. So welcome again to all of you and to all of you viewing. Uh, my name is Jim Linares. I'm the assistant principal for Mission at St. Lucia High, which is a faculty support uh, job and also has the spiritual formation as a part of it. So it's a cool job, grateful for it all the time. Um, and I've been invited to have this conversation with all of you about this crossing the disciplines from theology, faith, religion into what we all do every day in our classes and our activities uh, with our students. So in a moment, I'm going to have oops, each of you introduce yourselves a little bit about who you are and department you work in. And then I'd like each of you to respond to this prompt. What is God trying to do for and with your students through your classes or activities? What is God trying to do for your students through your activity and discipline um, in these young men? So there's your prompt. Um, so I've introduced myself. Um, Jennifer. Thank you. My name is Jennifer Carroll. This is my 10th year here at SLU High, and I am a member of the English department. I spend most of my time teaching freshman English and junior English, so I divide my time between those two curriculum. Um, I'm a member of various faculty committees, but I'm also helping to moderate NHS, National Honor Society. Not surprisingly for me, I think the way, I hope at least the way that my students are trying to experience God is through the literature that they read. Um, I'm reminded of one of the things that is in our junior curriculum, which is that we want our students to be alive and thinking human beings who, are, who have a story to tell and who know how to tell their story. Um, and I think part of that is, is just becoming more fully human and embracing their humanity. That's so much a part of, of understanding who we are, how we relate to each other, and, and part of how we relate to each other is the stories that we tell. We, we have these great works of literature um, that we study. Freshman year, I think of the Odyssey so much, um, the, you know, this classic work that has a lot to teach us about how we relate and, and interact with each other, um, how we are kind of our own heroes and how we talk to ourselves about our lives. Um, junior year, a, a work that we teach is Catch-22 for most of us, which has this just great ending. Um, and, and that's so often how I think about junior year, too, is, is how do we help the, these young men understand the, the great insights that these works of literature have to provide and, and how can they make the, those insights meaningful in their own lives. Jennifer, thank you. Thank you very much. Tim. Hi, uh, I'm Tim Kurt. I've been at SLU for 27 years, if you count my um, alum service corps time, I think we which should. I guess counts. I teach... Uh, uh, I teach uh, uh, well, now I, I've been an English teacher for a number of years, but I only teach one section now. I'm the freshman class moderator and summer school principal, but I spend most of my day as the uh, director of the learning center, um, helping students uh, in need of extra support and uh, helping chair our academic support team and, and helping facilitate student planning and uh, teacher um, meetings and relationships with students who are maybe need a little extra boost and some support. And so the question is, how do I see God working in the work I'm doing with students? So I could, I won't answer as an English teacher, although I have a lot of things to say about that. 
over the years since Jeff <laughs> discovered that. So I'll, I'll <laughs> and I want to come back to a couple of things. Some happened just today, but I won't talk. The, the um, I was thinking about that in the context of where I work with my students every day, and and my colleague um, Lissy and, and or my fellow learning coach, um, Mrs. Mrs. Tippett. What we find ourselves doing, and I think in a, a, a Ignatian term that that I've always been drawn to, is discernment of spirits. Like what is bringing you um, mm. true desolation and consolation, and and also the we even use the concept of examine spiritually and, and, and Ignatius is one who kind of gave us this great spiritual method for for brutally honest but also loving self-examination every day and every day I have kids telling themselves stories about their academic world that are both true and not true <laughs> <laughs> and and how to how to guide them through that experience in a way that doesn't feel like, you know, I love a picture in the, in the theology room of, of Ignatian spirituality and voices of God and voices of the evil spirit, and that, that doesn't encourage self-loathing or anxiety or judgment, even if in the process of really tense situations with students and their academic future, um, I'm feeling perhaps anxious, or they are, how to encourage them to discern the foundational, honest, but ultimately foundational loving way in which they're being called to work through these struggles and find solutions that seemingly at the beginning of our sessions don't seem possible. There's something incredibly incarnational and spiritual and I love having that language to mm -hmm. use with the other more generic metacognitive study work that we're doing here. Great. We're two, we're two respondents in. We already have a theme. Stories. Yeah. yeah. Right? That's right. great. Mary? Stories. Now I gotta change my answer. <laughs> uh, I'm Mary Russo. I've been at St. Louis U High for 21 years. Uh, biology and chemistry. Uh, I currently teach AP chemistry and regular chemistry. Uh, I'm also a curriculum. Uh, it's kind of a new role. You transition after a while, it seems, when you when you do your thing for quite a long time, into working with curriculum here at uh, at the school. I also help um, at, in the learning center three days three days a week help science students um, who kind of have trouble finding a way forward. I've got to help mm -hmm. them work with them in finding a way forward. Um, I've taught Fred just today, we talk about stories. I had, and I think this will be good, we had an alum back. I taught him freshman year. I taught him sophomore year. I taught him senior year. It was, it was like my, my one kind of year where everything came together while I was transitioning. And he's a, a fourth-year medical student. Currently, so he's talking to our medical careers club, and I'm sitting there thinking. Clearly, he was prepared. Science, foundationally, uh, at St. Louis High to graduate, biology, chemistry, physics. Schools will do it in different orders at different times, and biology, chemistry, physics, and they're going to get that here. They're going to get that here. There's no doubt about it. But science is a discovery process. Um, science needs reflection and um, um, uh, trust. It's a process and not a list of facts to, to memorize. Mm -hmm. And most certainly, um, you know, Tim, you were talking about the, the need for Ignatian discernment, reflection. Everything else I can teach these guys at any time. Getting them to stop and look and listen and reflect is totally something that I get through my Ignatian gym that you're part of, uh, the Ignatian formation that we get as faculty on a regular basis at, at St. Louis U High. So the skill of the scientist as informed by Ignatius, we talk about it all the time. We have to be explicit with it. We talk about it all the time. It actually makes them better scientists, better scientists. So I'm very happy to be part of, to be part of that work. Oh, beautiful comment. Thank you, Mary. Tracy. Well, I'm Tracy Lyons. This is my ninth year here at SLU, and I am a member of our math department. When I think about myself as a math teacher, especially at SLU, I think of myself as a geometry teacher because I've taught like a majority of geometry classes for almost all of my career here. So when I thought of this question, I think of myself as a geometry teacher, although I also teach statistics, but they are so different in their ways of like dealing with math, I think. Um, I don't think I have like the stories isn't a part of my class per se. And um, I always make a joke of like I started college as an engineer, but I wanted, but then I was like, no, I just want the, um, I don't want any of the application of the science. I just want the pure math, which is why like I don't have like the cool, you know, application of the science department. But if I think about geometry, I think about like 
we're seeking truth. Like we're we're writing proofs. We're talking about things that are true. How can we go from these sets of facts or um, about a figure, and how can we turn that into you know a bigger statement? I think that very closely aligns with what people are trying to do with their faith is, is seeking what is true. So it's a very short answer, but that's usually how I uh, do it. Oh, beautiful, Bob. Yeah, thank you so much. Bill. Hello, I'm Bill Anderson. I'm a member of the science department. I graduated from St. Louis High in 78, went to Spring Hill, graduated there in 82, and I've been teaching here for 38 years. So I've got quite a few years of Jesuit education under my belt. Uh, I've taught most levels of chemistry. I teach our IP environmental science class, and I teach our environmental STEM class. I'm heavily involved in the school community garden as well. And I've been very, very fortunate to be part of a project called Healing Earth. It's a textbook that was developed at the University of Chicago, or Loyola University of Chicago, uh, through the Jesuit Ecology Program. It's a free online text that's just absolutely remarkable. Um, way to approach environmental science, and it's a textbook that really all Jesuit high schools and colleges should be using. When I first got Jim's prompt a few days ago, there were two things that really leapt to mind for me. Um, one of them was the slide I start every year with. The first slide I always project just simply says science is awesome, and the awe in that is <laughs> italicized and capitalized, because it really doesn't matter if it's biology, chemistry, physics, environmental science, you can't help but look at the world around us and be awed by the mystery and the beauty of it. Uh, and I think that's one of the best parts of science. And we get a really good chance to see that in projects like our weather balloon launches. We launch the weather balloon twice a year, and the pictures that the boys get, especially the ones at 90 to 100,000 feet, where they're well up into the stratosphere, and you can see the curvature of the Earth, and you can see the, the gradations in color as the atmosphere transitions into space are just phenomenal. And it's an experience most high school kids are never ever gonna get, and it's something that it's great to be able to share with the community as a whole. I see it in simple things like this, the plants we've got in our AP environmental room that we're setting up for the garden. Um, in the fall, our, my seniors dug the sweet potatoes that last year's seniors mm -hmm. had planted. And this spring, we're starting new sweet potato slips from the leftovers of that last year. So they get to see that whole, whole life cycle. And it's something that many of our kids are just not aware of, how all of that works and what the circle of life looks like. The other big role that I see for my classes and myself is I see a great opportunity to keep them marginalized at the forefront of the conversations. Um, in chemistry, we talk about the water crisis in Flint, Michigan. We talk about fracking. We talk about climate change. Um, virtually everything in environmental science brings the marginalized to the forefront. Uh, and I think that's, that's one of the benefits of the Healing Earth text in environmental science. But I, thought, I think it's also an important role for us to make sure that that population has a voice somewhere. Thank you, Bill. We're really proud of that work that you've done, and it represents us so well. Thank you. Father Stewart. Thanks, Jim. I'm Father Matt Stewart. I'm a director of campus ministry here at St. Louis U High. I also teach senior theology. Um, this is my 11th non-consecutive year. <laughs> uh, four years as a student, six years as a lay teacher, and now back for my first year as a priest. So thrilled to be back. Um, in addition to, to my work teaching theology here, I also have a background in choral music. Uh, and so I'll kind of reflect on a couple of sides here if I can kind of speak on behalf of some of the fine arts folks as well. Um, as director of campus ministry, what God is doing through the students is uh, showing them the way to him in the world. Um, I firmly believe that Jesuit education is about teaching our students how to recognize where God arises in the world and then to opt for God when they encounter God in the world. Um, and so with whether it's a Kairos retreat leader or kids serving at mass or playing music or uh, writing a beautiful call to worship for those liturgies, um, I see God working through these boys trying to help them understand where he is in their lives and in the world. And then in theology, to take a chance to really systematically reflect on that in the tradition and the history of the church. Uh, and I teach a, a spirituality and prayer course right now to seniors. We're going through the rules of discernment of spirits, uh, giving them some real concrete situations in real life 
to say like choosing a major or college choice or whatever, um, where do you see the false spirit? Where do you see the good spirit at work? So trying to really get them. Um, and what I see God doing is unfolding for them this rich life that can and does exist when you embrace God in the world um, revealed in Christ. And uh, it's super exciting to see them kind of start to be like, wait a minute, these things have like real life applications, you know? Um, so it's, it's super cool to see that. Um, in my work with music, uh, having worked at Regis University, uh, working in music there, um, and Boston College, some other places, the thing that I think God is doing through at least choral music is it's really helping every person that sings find his or her voice. Um, that when God creates, God speaks. That we see that in the Old Testament. Jesus is the word made flesh. And so when we sing, we are creating words in a new way. Um, that we sing things into existence. So C.S. Lewis has Aslan singing the world into existence in the Chronicles of Narnia. Um, and so it's finding a unique voice that's yours that will blend in and become a part of a choir of voices that makes beautiful music. So it's how do I, how do I express who I am? And then how do, am I a part of something we are doing together? So it's sort of, I guess, my own riff on Paul's many uh, parts, one body. Yeah. Uh, many voices, one choir. Yeah. So, yeah. With apologies to St. Paul. Yeah. Sure. Well, I hope each of you can hear, as well as folks that might be watching, why I selected people like this. I mean, those are some beautiful statements that get us, that get us rolling, launched into the conversation. What I'd like to do is think about this conversation in, in two parts, and then we'll just sort of Take the, take the rules away, and we can just exchange with one another. But part one would be, uh, when and to what effect do we explicitly go to God in our classes? When do you open with prayer? When do you mention faith and theology? When do you label it with traditional religious and spiritual language and say, this is this? And if you do that on occasion, maybe tell us a little bit about what you think works. Uh, our physics teacher here, Paul Budendistel, must have a legendary lesson that he does over a couple of days about God and the cosmos or physics and the properties of physics because people have been talking about it for decades. Mm -hmm. I got to sit in on this class and hear what this thing is at some point. But it's made an impression on students. When we are praying with them and mentioning God out loud and explicitly, it's obviously an important moment. So that's the first part of the conversation is when do you do that and how and what have you learned that works well? The second part of the conversation is, I think, in the spirit of Ignatius and in the spirit of many of the comments that you've shared, how and when and to what effect can we create moments in our classes that are not explicitly religious and that may not even label God or prayer or theology or faith? And yet our job is to, through reflection and awareness, have our students understand that God is indeed in the midst of that. Do we do that? How do we do that? What's the challenge of doing that? I will just say as a commentator that we talk a little, a lot about, I think, interdisciplinary uh, work and bringing God into all things, but it turns out to be kind of a skill and not super intuitive, I have found. I'll tell one story to get us launched on that uh, in the second half of our conversation. I was with some saxophone players today, and Mr. Pottinger wanted them to hear, wanted them to, to play for me a three-minute piece four saxophones. It was gorgeous. And I finished listening to this thing and I say, guys, if that's not prayer, I don't know what is. Mm -hmm. And they all nodded in a, in a way of deep recognition that they understood what I was talking about. And I felt like that was a moment for me to say, this is this. So there's our two conversations. So who would like to open us up? When do you actually touch religious language and say, hey, this is spiritual, guys. Pay attention. Tell us a story or tell us what you've learned works well. Opening prayers, bringing God in. What, what have people learned? It's real easy in my AP Environmental Science classroom. I've got three posters in the front of the room. One of them's moral principles, one of them's moral goals, and one of them's moral virtues. And it's woven throughout our textbook. So it's it, the, the posters are always there in the forefront yeah. so that it, you know, I don't have to say anything, but at least it's there. And even when we do bring it up in class, um, it's, it's an easy conversation. So you're feeling it's like, Bill, it's, it, it's in the background of everything you do all the time. Yes, especially in the environmental science class. Yeah. More so there than chemistry. But 
definitely. Yeah, yeah. Well, what I'd say in theology is, is it's always in the forefront. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You know, if there's a class that goes by where I don't mention God or Jesus, I should be fired. Um, <laughs> We've got a problem. Yeah. So I think, but but I think what's helpful, and maybe this is bridging a little into the other uh, side of the conversation, is even though God is so explicit in the theology class, it's finding ways for the God that we're talking about, the God revealed in Jesus, that hooks onto their lives in real ways. And I would say that's where the, the skill comes from. That's the art of it in yeah, theology. It's, it's very easy yeah. to stand up there and you know, speak about doctrine and dogma and things like that. But how do we hook this onto your real life? You know, Where do you feel fear? Where do you feel love? Where do you feel consoled? Um, how do you experience awe? All these sorts of things. Um, so it's, you know, I'm talking about God all the time, but it's kind of one of these, like, have to come up with bizarre or strange uh, metaphors or, or examples to, to help it hook on to, to real life. Um, and then to say, I had a student ask me once, he's like, well, my, my grandparents talk about hearing God's voice. How how should I listen for it? Great question, huh? That's yeah. A great question. And this was one of our students who was on the hockey team who won the state championship. And I said, tell me what it was like to stand on the ice when your whole school was cheering for you and this is the end of your career. He's like, Oh, it was awesome. <laughs> and I said, I think that's how it's going to happen. Yeah. You know? And so to, to say, like, in the midst of what's happening in your life, pay attention to where you feel loved, where you're extending love, where you feel joy and hope and faith, a part of a community that can go out into the world and do something great. That's, you know, when maybe you're your grandparents' age, you'll hear it in the quiet still stillness of your, you know, knitting project or something. Yeah. But, uh, for now, it's probably going to be on the ice rink. And they're not making those connections unless we help them a little yeah. bit. Yeah, that's a great point. Anybody else? Bill talks about posters in his classroom. Who else has a practice that you, you kind of find works? I want to follow up on the posters. A couple years ago, they asked us to pretend we're a student in our class. I think it's something a lot of teachers do at other schools. And walk through the space and see what they're taking in. How's your furniture set up? What's the focus? Um, Matt, you talked about it's an insp- experience you encounter with your with your students. Um, cause I, I feel the same way. I'm not a teacher. Some days i got to be a teacher. The younger kids are sometimes more of a teacher than I, I want to inspire the guys. But we're on this journey together. Mm-hmm. And how is my classroom explicitly set up? So you'll notice oh, changes over the years, at least since I've been here, that um, students are kind of facing each other. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. We've now got these longer class periods because schedules have changed because we're looking for the development of, of a community approach, which takes time and trust and thought and attention, and uh, to, to push forward to get comfortable enough for real good exchange, for real good, ex- valued, right, valued exchange. And that starts with your space. So I was right in there with Bill, like, um, what are the posters I have on the wall that I haven't updated and I don't know how long and what message am I sending with just the things that they're taking in in my, in my space and if I could reference the pandemic I every class 23 years I've been teaching every class every class I start with a prayer every class and when the pandemic hit um, I didn't start with a prayer really I don't know why I'm not sure I can explain it yeah yeah and and it's a practice I haven't returned to, and I've, I've found myself reeling a bit. Mm. Finding, starting with prayer was always a grounding experience for our community. It could be, guys, time to start. Guys, settle down. Guys, have a seat. But when it's in the name of the Father, it's in the name of the Father. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, it's time. And, and, and they do it. And just the, we've been through something in the last few years. Mm. Um, Students have been through something, parents and families, and, and teachers have, have as well. And I'm, I'm looking to kind of ref, continue reflecting on a piece of what am I missing and what do I need, I need to get back in? Because it's the grounding piece for everything I do. You know what I like so much about your comment, Mary, is there's one thing to report, yeah, I pray in my class. It's another thing to report, I bring this spirit to it, and I wait for that spirit to be present in the classroom before I pray. And you're that kind of a person. I mean, you're really attentive to what your students are are thinking and feeling, because I've observed your class a ton, and you just do that all the time. Uh, Authentic prayer is different than just a prayer. Jennifer? Well, that's something that I was thinking about, too, is that the way I start class has always been with a prayer, and and I do still maintain that. Um, But it has changed over the course of my 10 years here. So the the first couple years, it was usually a prayer from someone else, a rote prayer, something more formalized and stylized. And it was fine and okay, but... 
the past several years especially, and, and part of it I'm sure comes from my own comfort, I, I do pray extemporaneously every single time. And, and a lot of times it's just something from my own life, whatever I feel I'm going to through, whatever. And, and I do try to say, like, I'm sure others in the room are going through this as well. But... Are you sometimes surprised by what you come up with? Um, or is it prepared? Sometimes I am surprised. Yeah. I, I, I usually... I. I am a routine enough teacher that I, I'm not maybe quite that extemporaneous, but <laughs> uh, for those of you that know me, that's no surprise. Um, this is incredibly funny for us. <laughs> I don't know about the audience at this time. But, um, but, it, but it is still, it, it usually comes from something that, I, that, that yeah, is going on in my own life or something that is going on in the world around us. It's recollected. You're sharing, you're yes. sharing a recollection. Even if it's something as simple as, you know, hey, we had a late start and we started with faculty meetings. Students, let's pray for the teachers in this building oh, yeah. because, <laughs> because the teachers are doing work that you don't see. And some, we need your prayers. Um, you're meeting the moment that's live in the room and you're pulling that into prayer. Yes. And, and, that, and that has seemed to help. And, and I, I do get the same reaction where it, it seems to be a great start to class and it does center us. And, and it's one of the things that I value about being able to bring into the classroom. Yeah. Every and I th- day. If I could just quick jump in, I think that what's so great about that is it teaches our students that that's what prayer actually is. You know, of course, it's, it's the liturgical prayer of the church. Of course, it's road prayer. Of course, it's that. But when you are with God who loves you, what do you say? And, and what's going on in your life? How do you respond to all the, the things that are happening? And my mom is always a great example of my life. She taught theology basically for 50 years and has recently retired. And, and a, a classmate that I went to high school with actually died earlier this month. And I found it fascinating that many of my old high school classmates, who, who I don't even keep in contact with really, were reaching out to my mom because she was their senior theology teacher. And, and they were having these kind of great, conversation she my mom was able to go to the funeral and and part of what I realize is that sometimes there's a there's a longer horizon on on what we do as high school teachers than sometimes I think we remember that it's not just the four years here and it may be for the 40 year olds later on that they think back to maybe it was the model that their you know English teacher gave or whatever it is that yeah um one of one of the slides you often share Jim is that like we need to we need to be our own adults because the students are looking at us. And, and I hope that, yeah, what I model in the classroom on a daily basis is something that, even if they don't realize it right now, maybe later on in their life, they will. Tracy, as a former uh, math trauma sufferer and a person who probably <laughs> prayed in math classes but probably not so productively, uh, what's a window into God in math class? So... One explicit way that I actually have never led my classroom during the school year with this prayer, but I use in a program that Mary and I teach in in the summer, and Tim's been involved with for a long time, Upward Bound. That's for rising 7th and 8th grade boys. That program right now is very centered on like working with them as how can they have a growth mindset with their learning? What skills do they need? How can they grow to like love and find joy in learning and not just feel like rote and routine and whatever, uh, traumatic. Um, (laughs) Unfortunately. So I lead prayer one morning with the patient trust prayer, which I think is probably one of my favorite like personal prayers. And it's, it's like about growth mindset, which is so wonderful for them. But I think about that in my classroom, like, especially I tell all the parents of geometry students specifically, like we're going to write a bunch of proofs this fall and proofs are hard. And Seven kids are going to figure them out on this day, and then like two more kids the next day, and then five more kids a week later, and then there will be these kids who it's very traumatic for, and they're never going to quite catch on. But like it's going to be a struggle, but that's part of the journey is getting through that. Yeah. And there is a day when it clicks, and when that kid can finally say like, "Oh, I get it," and then they tell me, and it's just so exciting. Or I talk to their parents, and they're like, "He said last week that they finally make sense. That there is beauty in the struggle. It is going to. It could be hard." Um, but having, you know, having patience with it, um, cause we don't know like what it could be, right. That's like kind of the end of the prayer. And so you're, th- that, that connection you're talking about is made explicitly in your class. You're working them through the narrative of what they're experiencing, but you're also saying this belongs in your prayer, right? You are including that point of reference, which reminds me, Tim, of what you were saying, uh, when you did your introduction, am I right that Ignatius finds his way into the learning center in terms of yes. explicit well, there's mentions? A lot of, there's a lot of things. I was blessed years ago to do the annotations. And so that's 
And I kind of, I'd say I did them 80%, <laughs> to be honest. But it was really great. To, but so my point was I actually got, after all these years of, of being in a Jesuit school, I really realized, oh, this is actually linked to the, to the written spiritual exercises and the rhythms and rituals that, that Ignatius kind of learned himself while coming through pretty traumatic stressors. And what I took away from that as I transitioned to a, to a job that dealt with kids who are having executive function issues or struggles is it's okay to be explicit. In fact, you, it's, it's, it's very helpful to be explicit in asking for what you want out of a particular prayer session. Yeah. And what I took from that is all the research on resilience now, especially in times of, of, of crisis, is about the importance of rhythms and rituals. And so my teaching changed a lot in that way as an English teacher as well as in the learning center because kids need explicit rituals that they can be taught to come back to. And within that, because I used to be, oh, no, if it's, if it's too formulaic or stuck, then there's no, I need, I need to feel that spontaneous connection. But actually, within that scaffolding is incredible you know, movement of heart and, 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 and productivity and just, just responsiveness. And so... I do those things like we do these executive functioning skill gathering in the chaos of the opening of class, but the fifth guy who, and then you make the guys the reminders and it is the reminder, okay, Mr. we need to pray. And then we start with the mindfulness training and we take three breaths and we, we, wow. we do a lot more. It's pretty thoroughly worked out too. Yeah. Well, it, because it came up because of this is stuff that actually puts us in our, our, our regulated space to actually begin. And I found it felt hokey to me at first, but it, going through the training and doing this is one of the things that kids write about later is thank you for the breathing, thank you for the mm-hmm. prayer, and then ask for the thing you want from the class mm-hmm. that day. And they respond quite well to that. And I do, because otherwise I would be off running right into the content. And there's all kinds of ways to find great incarnational stuff in the content, especially as the literature teachers you're talking about. Mm. But it is nice that I'm teaching these patterns, and that's what happens in the learning center all the time is we remind ourselves, we're teaching you rhythms and rituals of how a student perseveres through through healthy, necessary struggle. Wow, that's it's, a, it's okay to make that explicit, yes, because you need it. And that's what I felt like Ignatius was doing for me during the exercises when I was going through that as an adult with kids, even at that yeah. point. And I've been here long enough that I can remember back to when these kinds of connections between what we're actually doing in class and our spirituality weren't very explicit. We just assumed that. Yeah, I didn't, for the first 15 years of my yeah. career, I didn't do it that way. And I think what we're realizing now is we've got to graph these two things together, and we've got to have explicit reference points, like the posters, like the language you're using. We, we have to have that. But let me transition us to sort of that second half of the conversation, which is what is the art of being in the midst of a unit that doesn't have anything explicitly to do with, with God, faith, or religion, and having our kids attend to the fact that, of course, God is there, um, those saxophone players. Uh, I wanted them to know that, for me, that moment was spiritual. What have you learned about the craft of doing that, the difficulty of doing it, the opportunity uh, that is there in, in doing that in some of your classes? You've talked a little bit about it. Anybody want to take that a little bit further? Maybe I'll talk a little about like choral warm-ups. Perfect. It's it's something very discreet. Wouldn't yeah. appear to have anything much to do with exactly with spirituality. Um, but you know, you warm up a choir not usually because they're cold, but because you want them to work on a particular skill. Yeah. Whether it's intonation or breathing or, or vowels or rhythm or whatever, um, and to get people working together on a project. Um, and they start. I remember my very first day in band, freshman band here with Doc Milak. Way back yeah. When. I remember the first time we played a concert B flat major scale, and I was like, Th- "This is thrilling." <laughs> um, that there's this excitement that comes with being a part of an ensemble, um, and I think it's in those moments that we, in a as a musician or in a choral setting or, or a band setting or theater or, or what have you, where you say like that you, that you just felt. Let's talk about that. Let's live in that moment, and it opens up. You know, uh, we were talking before we started filming about wonder. You know, and um, and all that. That's like in this moment, you've made a connection with somebody that's bizarre. You're singing nonsense syllables, and all of a sudden, we're harmonizing. And um, so, I think that kind of helping draw their attention to 
we're not talking about theology. We're not singing a religious song. We are not, we're not even singing music, really. We're just warming up. But in that moment, we are forming the instrument that we're going to play together. Yeah, that's great. You know, the, the, the skill I'm picking up there is the art of pausing when these moments arise and saying, do you see what's happening here? Can, yeah. you, can you sense how important this it's is? It's sort of the old teachable moment. Yes. You know, and it, and it's, Being sensitive yeah. to those and stopping, and it doesn't have to be for long, yeah. right? Yeah, that's, that's great. One of the things I do a lot, especially with freshmen, is make sure that they talk to a partner, that they work in groups, and we change seats regularly. And I'm just aware of they need to form those bonds, they need to form those connections. And it's probably not something that I say explicitly, but it does, there, there are moments that I'm always aware of when freshmen become, seem to become friends and, and possibly in English class. And, and I can see connections that just continue on for several years. It's like, that oh, okay. I, I remember when you guys were sitting next to each other. Trauma. Yeah. <laughs> Every friendship starts with one encounter. Yeah. And, and that's just, and, and by the end of the year, I no longer know where to put some of them because it's like, no, you just always talk and <laughs> I need to separate you a little bit. But, um, it was one of the things that I, you know, Mary, you talked about the pandemic. It was one of the things that I actually felt most keenly last year for the freshmen was they, they didn't have that. They weren't together. Mm-hmm. They weren't in those groups. It was, it was really devastating. And that made me appreciate just that much more, you know, being back this year that we were able, I was, I was able to do some of that same small group work. And, and there was, I hope, and I think just a lot of, a lot of joy and a lot of friendship and, and bonds that were formed that are so important and sustaining and, and, yeah, and until we felt the lack of them, I didn't quite, you know, think about it as much. One thing I push forward coming off of that in my classroom, the relationship piece mm-hmm. is key, 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 key. Relationship, trust, change. So if they feel valued, if they value each other, if they feel like They've got a voice that I'm hearing. Sometimes I'm going to address it. Sometimes maybe it's not appropriate. Sometimes maybe it's, hmm, interesting. If they feel valued there, then they're going to start to trust me. And if they start to trust me and their colleagues, so I like to use, I call them doctor, just to make them a little, you know, feel a little fancy. Right? I'll say, say good morning to your colleagues. I always give them a prompt. What would you have for breakfast? Who, who watched the Cardinals game last night? Uh, what would you do this weekend? Yeah, just, something, some yeah. just something to get them looking at each other, connecting with each other. We are a community in our classroom because chemistry is, it's abstract. Yeah. It takes a tough rust. Right. And I've got to get them there, and we have to do that. And it's not easy. We yeah. have to do that through, through relationship building. And, um, and community building, really. That's what 100%. you're talking about. 100%. Yeah. And I've been an observer in Mary's class, and a thing she will do is to say, how you doing? Anxious? Confused? You got, you got a furrowed brow there. What's going on there? She's just relentless about having them attend to what's going on inside themselves, which is the whole class realizing, hey, she's looking out for us. We need to look out for each other. Something pretty fundamental to religious practice, right? Yeah, well, that's great. But just trusting the process, getting our kids to know that it's hard. I mean, Tracy, you brought this up before. You can do hard things. Yeah. You can do hard things. <laughs> it is not going to be easy, and it's, they're so used to being able to even voice activation. Here comes the answers. Mm. Here comes the information. Um, but that's not curated, and you, you haven't internalized that stuff until you fail with it and wrestle with it and give it away because there's vulnerability in giving it away. So for me in AP Chemistry, it's lab. <laughs> AP Chemistry, I, it's like a shark tank in there. I mean, these guys, are, they're, they're all wanting to... <laughs> They all want to do well. I have a lot, however it works. I have a lot of high-achieving students in there who have placed a lot of value on um, just just their, their status with, with grades and things like yeah, that. Yeah. And I'm almost trying to crack them just, just a bit. And they'll start a lab and they'll get angry. And the lab's not going well. And what, what are we doing this for? And can you trust me? Do you trust me? Mm-hmm. And it's moving forward. I don't even know what I'm doing. So I said, go ahead, get that out. Good. Now, Keep going. Yeah. <laughs> Keep pushing forward. Just don't stop. Just don't stop. And then they give it away. They have to present their data. And when they're presenting their data, it's not about, hey, got you, man, got you. I knew your group wasn't doing that because we critique everyone in, mm-hmm. in the classroom. It's not about critique. It's about, aha, have you thought about this? It's the power of what a community, where a community can take you, that you can't get there on yourself. Yeah. yourself. Yeah. And these guys in that class, they think they can get them by themselves. Oh, there's a whole nother plane. Yeah. There's a whole nother plane waiting for them when they realize the power of community. 
yeah. giving it away and, and, and going back and forth. Right. We mo- sorry, I no. cut you off, but I think we also model the community building within our adult community. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think our students, whether we realize it or not, are paying attention to that. Um, and we've got an awesome community. I know within the science department, we really, really look out for each other. Um, we can do hard things. We can do, <laughs> do them well together. Um, and it's, it's, it's an important thing for us as humans to have that community and that sense of community and that sense of somebody's got your back when you need to. Uh, but it's also, like I said, a good modeling for our young men to see that as well. But, you know, that's how adults interact with each other. That's yeah. I, I think it's so important for our guys to know, even if we don't tell them, to know that we pray ourselves and that we build community ourselves. I know they can read it. And so, you know, maybe as we get towards the end of our session, maybe talk a little bit personally. How do you pray better and relate to God better for the sake of the young men that you've been able to teach and accompany? Uh, I certainly feel very moved even by the question because I'm thinking of guys I I coached in running uh, who who changed my life uh, and brought me closer to God. There's just no question of it. Does that speak to anyone? How are you different as a spiritual person yourself, which would then affect those guys because they're in your presence every day? How are you closer to God because of... I, I was thinking about this question a little bit before, partly because I, I did teach at the public school for five years, yeah. and, and then I made the transition here when I got married and, and needed to move. Um, and one of the first things I felt when we had professional development, certainly you know the literature that I teach is that bringing in God and faith could be part of it. And it just seemed to complete it in a way that made it much more meaningful. Um, professional development can always be something that's uh, hated and <laughs> contentious and <laughs> fraught. Um, no. <laughs> I know, right. Yeah, it's your <laughs> but <laughs> being able to, to always kind of bring it back to that faith um, and, and bringing spirituality into it seemed to complete it in a way I was like, yes, that's, that feels right. Even in the midst of all the struggle that is real with professional development, having that, that faith component um, seemed to make it more, more meaningful and, and more something that I could, could really you know, wrestle with and grasp in a way that is just wonderful for me. Yeah. Uh, that, that awareness that, that even in the midst of this job that I'm doing, there is a faith component to it. Um, I find it very, very sustaining. Yeah. Tracy, I know one of the cool things about my job is I know a lot of journeys people go on. So I know you've done a lot of spiritual formation work in your own life. Has it fed back into what you do as a teacher? And has that been a huge fertile part of how you've grown in prayer and spirituality? Absolutely. I think it's helped me kind of like regroup or get re-energized like at the end of a school year or whatever um, and not maybe burn out um, kind of more easily than maybe I would have otherwise. Um, and I think it also makes me more aware of like what parts of this job are the reason that I keep going. You know, like yeah. what about the boys? What about the students? D- helps me in my prayer life, helps me grow in my faith. I would, I really go back to this word joy. Um, not that I'm not a joyful person, but I do live in what I like to refer to as my den of cynicism. Um, <laughs> I just tend to be like a little bit more on like the pessimist side of things or like I kind of, have a cynical, like ironic sense of humor at times. Um, and I deliver my jokes with a deadpan. But like the joy that the students have about, you know, seeing them at a game or seeing them in the hallway or, and for really like in the classroom, like sometimes, you know, geometry or stats isn't the most exciting thing, but they do get excited when they work on a problem and it's going well or like they are excited about a new topic or whatever. But them and like the joy of being a young person for them, like brings me energy about about my job and about, you know, feeling as, as if this were a, a call for me. Yeah. So hope and optimism to a person mm-hmm. who might otherwise have a little bit of a dark spirit. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Bill, you know, I would like to ask you on this question of optimism and hope. Uh, you deal every day with the state of the planet. And the state of the planet is kind of terrifying right now. And and I'm at home sometimes meditating on it, meditating on it and getting in a pretty bad place. How do you draw hope? from your students about this very sobering reality that we're all facing. It's funny because uh, Jack and his 
article in the Trump News asked me that same question mm -hmm. or a similar question the other day. Um, and I think the hope comes primarily from the youth that I see on an everyday basis and that I've had the opportunity to work with uh, throughout the years. I see them here struggling with those questions um, and, and grappling with ways to make a difference. I also see uh, students that we've taught that are out there making a difference, that are working in science or business or as engineers that are really having an impact on, on our society and on our climate. And I think that's the fact that we're, we're seeing that surge in the young is, is really what keeps things going. Uh, beautiful. Tim, if you wouldn't mind, maybe you'll be one of our closing voices. You have the benefit of having recent graduates <laughs> from St. Louis U High. And so I wanted to ask, we're talking about God being reflected in the disciplines in the learning process. When you think about your guys and they're out there making the next path out, you know, for themselves in the world, what do you see that consoles you that this thing we're talking about is actually happening for them? I think one of the most like hope-filled um, things I'm most gratified for, like watching these guys who have my, my own sons who've gone through this experience, um, wherever they are being, you know, 20 through 24, it's not a, for, for many people, it's not the most um, religious identifying That's right. <laughs> age That's in right. terms of spiritual practice and, 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 and just attending. But what I've, I just know that when they do jobs that connect them back to the kind of foundation they were given, not just through what, what Teresa and I have been able to give our whole lives, but 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 that was so reinforced and and complicated and nuanced and celebrated during these key formative years. In those conversations, when they're talking about the next stage of their life or what they're interested in or what they're stressed about or anything else, I can actually hear their heart kind of expanding when they're drawn to the things that are most important in the world and and and, and that matter, yeah. not just to the world but beyond the world. And they don't put, they don't want to put a lot of explicit religious language to it all the time, but they're showing up and they're there. And that brings me as a, as a, I often say to them, like, I just, I just don't want to be weird when you're at mass at my funeral, like years ago. I just, I just, I just I'm so connected that you still know that this mattered to us. It mattered all my life. But when I, when I hear them thinking through these things and I'm like, they're going to be all right. God is with them. They're, they're connected to it. And, and whenever they're connected to activities, social justice issues, or thinking being out in nature that they got in Bill's class or um, all the social activities and the leadership training that you guys did for my other kids and when they were doing those things, that's when I see their heart on fire. And even if they're not putting the first thing, their first choice is not to put explicit theological language to it, I see their heart jump. And that at least says it's going to be all right. The world's going to be complicated. Their lives are going to be yeah. complicated. But it's, there's, a, there's a foundation that's been built there that I'm very happy. That's us recognizing that God is with them. Right. The explicit connections maybe have to continue to be made. And, and right. your story about your kids is near and dear to me because I taught field biology for many years in the walkabout program, and I had both your guys. Yeah, yeah. And at one point, hearing some bluegrass music, they said, hey, walkabout, baby. Right. You know? right. But I felt like the ember's still there. It's, right. still, it's still alive. Well, this has been a total delight, Father Stewart. I wondered if you could maybe uh, we'll pause for a moment, and could you take us out on prayer? I'd be happy to. Thank you. Eternal Lord of all things, we come before you with the spirit of gratitude for having revealed yourself to us in so many ways, through art and music, through literature and poetry, through math and chemistry and the environment and in a most particular way in your son, who has shown us and led us back to you. Be with all of our students and help them to discover you in the world and have the courage to choose you when they find you. We ask this all in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen.